Live, we are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. I didn't know how to turn the microphone on. I am here in uh, San Francisco, California, Sports Byline USA. I was just talking to Rick Tittle and Darren and Dom. And it's the first time that I've been here since I think 2012, 2013-ish, somewhere around there. Might have been uh, a little more recent, but uh, this is my second time in studio. So I guess there's a sign on the door over there that says once every 10 years. And in fact, it is true. Once every 10 years, I show up here at Sports Byline at USA. And uh, we've got a lot to talk about on the show here today. Mike Sempervivi is going to join us in the next segment. Obviously, the big story last night, AEW Dynamite. We talked uh, all day about the idea of having a an overrun. And uh, apparently, you know, Dave in the Daily Update had said, make sure you set your VCRs 30 extra minutes. We were trying to figure out what we need a, an overrun for. And at the end of the day, we had a two-minute overrun which saw the debut of a giant. And we'll tell you who it was, why they did it, and how this ties into the Discovery Time Warner merger. We've also got all of the championship matches on the show, including Red Dragon versus Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus for the AW World Tag Team titles, which we expected to be a, a title change, but was in fact not a title change. And in the main event, we did have a new Ring of Honor television champion as Samoa Joe ended up winning the ROH television title from Minoru Suzuki. So we'll say about that and so much more. Back in a moment to really get the show on the road, Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, com. Every it's segment. Like, it's like I've never done this before. <laughs> There's like a button to turn the mic on and then a oh. button to turn the mic off. Well, and... It's like laughing. Muscle memory. You're so used to doing a certain thing. Now you're in a whole new home. Got to get used to it for a day or two. I am. I haven't figured out a good angle for the Twitch homies either, so I apologize, everybody. I'm I'm doing my best here, but... I hey. just hope producer Dom pops up right behind your shoulder uh, from the other side of the glass and says hello. Well, luckily, this is, uh, you know, that uh, tinted glass, so I can I can just barely see him. I just see his white hat nodding up and down as he chuckles at my uh, my incompetence here. <laughs> anyway, we've got a lot of news to get into here today, everybody. We can uh, jibber-jabber more here as we get going. But uh, obviously, the big story last night coming off this... Uh, well, you know, we'll get into that in a moment, actually. i got a bigger story, which is the update on uh, Shinjiro Otani. Zero One has provided an update on Shinjiro Otani. The promotion released a statement on Thursday updating fans on the 49-year-old's condition. He underwent surgery on Wednesday to prevent further deterioration of a cervical spinal cord injury. The procedure is said to have gone as planned. Otani has been transferred to another hospital. His wife... Eriko Otani released a statement as well. She says, I married a professional wrestler, Shinjiro Otani. So I was prepared to accept a situation like this, but when I think of Shinjiro's disappointment, I cry. However, we will not look down but forward, and with the help of pro wrestling, we will continue to support Mr. Shinjiro. We will do our best with your warm support. We hope that you will continue to watch over us warmly. Finally, I would like to ask for your continued support for Zero One and all the wrestlers that Mr. Shinjiro has been protecting. So, no up Update on on his ability to move his arms and legs or or anything. We only know that he got a surgery and that it was considered to be successful. So, all of the best to Otani, and uh, hopefully we get some good news sometime soon. Yeah, not much to add there at all. Very uh, just a heartbreaking statement there, but obviously. Looking to move forward, uh, hopefully, in, in New Japan running this weekend. Uh, I know, you know, a lot of people see that face wash spot in the corner. And, you know, I don't know who a lot of people now kind of identify with that spot. Chris Dickinson, though, you know, uses it. And I would bet uh, a good deal of money that his influence was Shinjiro Otani, who used that move. I don't want to say first, you know, but he used it. Uh, probably he was the most known for it, at least when I was coming up watching wrestling. And that's kind of who everybody got it from. So all the best to his family. Hopefully there's some sort of miracle. He regains the feeling. And and uh, again, the quality of life is all that matters at this point. 
So last night was Dynamite, and uh, one of the big stories we'd been talking about was the overrun. Tony Khan had announced there was going to be an overrun, and we were wondering why. And David suggested setting your VCR for an extra 30 minutes, your DVR or whatever. And uh, as it turned out, it was a two-minute overrun, which was built around the debut of a giant the ending of Dynamite featured the debut of Satnam Singh, and it was designed to build the AEW brand in India and has a lot to do with the Warner Media Discovery merger. AEW has been on television on the Discovery owned channel Eurosport India, a deal Tony Khan made based on the impending merger. As part of the first week after the Discovery merger, Tony Khan wanted to shoot an angle that would be a breakthrough in that market, using someone of some renown in that country as the only Indian born player ever drafted by the NBA. When Singh was a second-round draft choice of the Dallas Mavericks in 2015, even though he never played college basketball or pro basketball overseas, he never made the NBA but played several years in the NBA Summer League, G League, and National Basketball League of Canada. Signed by AEW in September in an attempt to create a star for the India market. He'll be managed by Sanjay Dutt, who gained uh, notoriety in India years back when he wrestled for TNA, when TNA had a following in India. And both will be used to promote AEW on Eurosport India in that market. Singh, Dutt, and Jay Lethal will be a group of AEW on AEW television, pushed as a lead act in a promotion uh, of the brand in India. So if you saw it, what they did was they had a main event with uh, Samoa Joe and Minoru Suzuki. It was a great main event. And I thought the show overall, as we'll get to, was a, was a great show. But uh, Samoa Joe won. And then, and this is what I think the big mistake was, the lights went out. And anytime you turn off the lights, the fans are expecting, who's it going to be? Uh, might be this person, might be that person. You know, regardless of who it is, somebody that they will know. And the lights turn out, and they turn back on, and there's a tall guy. And I think everybody was like, okay. And then the tall guy lumbered around, and he squeezed Samoa Joe and, and beat him up and everything like that. And it wasn't like it was, it was, uh, I know some people think it was like a horrible angle. It was fine. I mean, you've got to debut a guy. It's a giant. He's going after Samoa Joe. But I think the issue was, by turning off the lights and getting everybody excited about who was going to be, they were let down because they had no idea who this guy was. And so he beats up Joe for two minutes, and then that's it. Away they go. The show goes off the air. And, you know, a lot of people not uh, not big fans of this angle. No, I would not say it was a tipping point. It was just, uh, you know, it was a very WWE-style angle. It was the debut of The Great Khali. It was the debut of... Uh, Giant Silva was a debut of just some random Oma, some giant, and we get so much of that in WWE that I, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't my thing. I didn't like it. I was all right. I can't say I didn't like it. It was just there. You know what it was like, and I don't know if it, how anybody could say this is some sort of tipping point or anything like that. I mean, it was the tipping point for the night, I guess, where you know you didn't want to get dessert and you tipped because. It was like the whole night was like you get a bone-in ribeye, you get all these fantastic sides, you know, the, the everything is a, it's a delicious meal that, you know, of high quality and then at the end they kind of gave you this McDonald's drive-through cup that little Sunday they have. It's kind of melty and it's not even real ice cream. It's this weird, you know, mix of of different things and it's just like you know, that's kind of what it was. And I it was underwhelming for sure, I think, because of the match that they had and the lights going out and people knowing that he's out there and who's involved. Claudio, you know, I'm not I'm not sure what it was. But one thing I know for sure is it didn't hit, but that's OK. I don't know where they're going to go with this guy. I know he was obviously drafted for the NBA, so he does have some physical talent, you know, but. We'll see. We have gone through this so many times from El Gigante, you know, down now to Omas. And how many of those guys are effective? You know, <laughs> it hasn't happened all that often. Often, And oftentimes when they should use someone in a 911 type of role where they just go out there and throw them around. No, we, we got to see if they can work. We got to be insistent upon that. So, hey, 
I I don't know if this guy's the answer in India, but he certainly if this is sometimes these are the things that you do. And that's OK, because you're trying to reach out. You're trying to make new fans. You're trying to let somebody have somebody that they can identify with. And I this is at least a fresh start, at least with Kali, even though that didn't work. It was a fresh start. Whereas, at, you know, Jinder Mahal, when they tried it, you took a guy who's been a jobber. He was a joke. He's a complete buffoon. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, he's going to be the star of India. And then by the time he got to India, he wasn't even the champion. So two different philosophies in wrestling that we know right now. We'll see how AEW takes things. But uh, remember when Ring Ka King for a little while was far better than watching TNA? No, I don't you remember don't, that. You don't no. remember those days. But and, I, I do uh, I do see a no. lot of people here on the Twitch chatter are... Uh, <laughs> oh, hey, look listen. at him. Now he's kicked back now. Well, I changed the camera angle, so... Uh, <laughs> but listen, hey, uh, you know, some people here are going, oh, man, you know, this was the worst angle they've ever shot in the history of AEW. Listen, I'm not saying that it was, like, a great angle, and when it was over, I was like, oh, man, that's money right there. But, bro... This was far from the worst angle in the history of AEW. Maybe because we'd had such a great show and it was such a letdown, you might have a, a you know, sort of an inflated view of how bad it was, but there have been way worse angles. And there were actually worse segments on the show, although the show overall I thought was excellent. Back in a moment to talk about it, Observer Live. I think I finally got this all figured out. It only took me a half hour. Oh, man. Now we, somebody now we take can, a, should we start the show over again? No, somebody take a screenshot of Brian right now. Him kicked back right there. And then make sure that you tag Zack Sabre Jr. and hashtag chicken chest. Oh, get out of here. You're an idiot. <laughs> hey, let's talk about this, uh, this AEW show. I thought it was an excellent show overall, with the exception of the, uh, the women's match. You guys see that women's match? Marina Shafir? Holy smokes. I got a lot to say about that one. But it opened up with CM Punk and Penta, which I thought was an excellent opening match. Uh, Punk decided he wanted to be a luchador because he was facing Penta. So he's trying all sorts of uh, springboard flip into the arm drag, the whole nine yards. Then he goes up top and he's going to do like a springboard into a Frankensteiner. And he, he literally misses by a mile. He like springboards, but instead of going up, he goes down. And then he fell down and crashed and uh, sold his knee. And uh, they kind of sort of turned into a spot there for a second. Then they get back on track, and he, he ended up hitting that top rope Frankensteiner. But at the end of the day, uh, hit the uh, GTS off a springboard by Penta, and he got the pin. So uh, Punk racking up wins here, and he'll likely be getting the championship uh, title match at the end of May. Uh, versus the winner of Hangman Page and uh, and Adam Cole, which is coming up on Friday, Rampage, in a Texas death match at 4 p.m. here in San Francisco. 4 p.m. on the West Coast. Not ideal. No. We had uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus versus Red Dragon for the AW Tag Team titles. Most people figured this was going to be a title change, and in fact, it was not. And they had a very, very good match. And uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus hit the Thoracic Express and got the pin. And to me, the key to this was afterwards, O'Reilly goes after them, and FTR comes out to make the save, and they made a point that FTR was the double crown champions. And of course, when you hear double crown, what's the first thing that comes into your, into your mind? Why, it's the triple crown. And so I immediately thought, you know what? Maybe it's actually going to be FTR, who are the next AEW World Tag Team Champions, and they will be the Triple Crown Champions, holding all three sets of these belts. So I think that you could actually do... Uh, I would prefer a singles match, but with, with uh, O'Reilly and everybody uh, doing the attack afterwards, this might end up being a three-way with all three titles on the line, which would be a fantastic match. I guess we'll see where they end up going, but that's what I thought uh, coming off of that. We had Sean Dean and MJF, which I loved with every ounce of my being. So Sean Dean has beaten MJF by disqualification early this year. So, of course, you know, you watch all this WWE and you figure, okay, MJF's going to go in there, he's going to get his win back. So MJF gets in the ring and he's, he's just killing poor Captain Sean Dean. And then all of a sudden they cut backstage and... 
Wardlow has arrived. There's bodies everywhere. And uh, Wardlow shows up and he starts beating up all these dudes. And they're sending out like 500 security guys, just one guy after another. And Wardlow's killing all of them. And MGF's freaking out and he's running around outside like a chicken with his head cut off. And uh, and finally he's on the ramp and all of a sudden he looks up and uh, he sees Bryce Remsburg. And Remsburg's like, seven, eight, nine. And MGF's like way at the top of the ramp. And MGF goes, oh, let's see Bryce. He goes, listen. I don't know what Tony Khan's paying you, but whatever he's paying you, I'll give you triple if you just don't say 10. And Bryce looks around to the crowd, and they're all cheering, and he goes, 10! And the place goes crazy, and MGF's furious. He's lost again to Captain Sean Dean, this time by count. He's so angry. This was awesome. Now, I hate to say it because, uh, you know, he's an idiot, dislikable person, but uh, MGF was totally in the right like what was this guy counting for there was a riot outside of the ring and there's like five thousand security guys between mjf and the ring and you're counting so i hate to say it but uh well if we're going to be serious about that then i am going to be serious well if you're a serious man if you're going to do that then how what sense would it make for mjf to get on the mic and tell try to bribe an official he could either be suspended fired something like that and who cares the decision could be overturned anyway and he would have just had another loss off the off tv so look at these geeks if you're going to go that direction with that then, this guy then, goes, Bryce is a stickler for the rules. Bro, there was a riot that broke out outside the ring. The rules should be that this was a no contest. What are you counting the guy out for? Hey, look, anyway, rules, all right? <laughs> uh, the Jericho Appreciation Society versus Eddie Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz. And they had a very good match. There were a lot of very good matches on this show. And uh, 2.0, which had been beaten up earlier uh, in the parking lot, they show up, and of course they get beat up like geeks. And then it ends up with uh, Kingston finally getting his hands on Garcia after all this time. But then behind the referee's back, Jericho hits Kingston in the back with Floyd the Bat, and and uh, Kingston's pinned. So this feud must continue. I didn't like, notice. Did Ange get his shoes back? No. He did a run in barefoot. That's, they're going to be hanging over a wire outside of somebody's house over there. <laughs> and then, my God in heaven of almighty, Marina Shafir in sky blue. I didn't hate this. So, Am I a bad person? Listen, well, it wasn't like it was, you know, here's what happened, everybody. Okay. They had about 3,000 tickets sold in a 4,000-seat building. So they maybe got, you know, I don't know, three, four hundred people walk up. There's probably about thirty, four hundred people in this building. Okay. So for most of the show, you would think that there was ten thousand people in this building. This crowd was so hot for stuff on this show. Until Marina Shafir came out to face Sky Blue. And I think that they figured, well, you know, everyone likes Sky Blue, so we'll get some, you know, baby face sympathy or whatever. Well, they were wrong. You would think that there were, and I'm not even making this up, zero people in this building. You would think that there was less people in this building than there were during the pandemic when there was nothing but wrestlers around the ring. They were deadly silent for this match. And uh, Marina beat her up and looked mean, and nobody cared. And uh, I'm going to need more time after the break to further dissect this segment. But holy smokes. The quarter, I'm going to have to see the quarter for this. Watch it be sky high, but I don't think yeah, it's going to be. <laughs> the highest rated thing. Oh, my God, can you imagine? We had uh, Team Taz versus uh, Keith Lee and Swerve Strickland. Ricky Starks here in his hometown. He's just beloved. And so they didn't have him go out there like Miz and bury the town to get booed. He was just beloved. And they had a good match. And uh, Powerhouse Hobbs, after interference from Taz... Hit Keith Lee, not Swerve Strickland. He hit Keith Lee with a gigantic spine buster, and he pinned him in the middle of the ring. A huge win for Powerhouse Hobbs. Big win for Starks in his hometown. I like this a lot. Every part great. of that match worked perfectly, I thought. The result, the fact he didn't beat Swerve, it's a big win for uh for powerhouse Hobbs Lee has looked good I mean everything about that I thought worked perfectly 
Then we have, uh, here are the lineups. Rampage Friday live. We have a Texas death match, Hangman Page, Adam Cole. We have the Blackpool Combat Club versus the Gun Club in a six-man. We got the uh, Ruby Soho, Robin Renegade, Owen Hart Foundation tournament qualifier. I wouldn't be surprised if Ruby Soho won this whole tournament, by the way. I just want to throw that out there. Battle of the Belts, we have Scorpio Sky and Sammy Guevara for the TNT title. Jonathan Gresham and Dalton Castle. For the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Championship. And Thunder Rose will be facing Nyla Rose. I'm going to need more time after the break to talk about that segment, by the way. And then uh, Dynamite next week, we have got Wardlow versus The Butcher. Dr. Britt Baker returns in Britsburg against Daniel Camella. Jungle Boy versus Kyle O'Reilly Owen Hart Foundation Tournament Qualifier. Darby Allen versus Andrade in a coffin match. Tony Khan will make a huge announcement and uh, I told you guys a few weeks ago that when he had that Ring of Honor announcement, uh, that was not 100% confirmed uh, before uh, you know he made his announcement that he had an announcement. So he said he had an announcement before they were sure that that was actually going to be the announcement. So there has been a backup announcement for a while now, and uh, we're going to find out what that is coming up on uh, Wednesday. Brian, I regret to inform you, by the way, Ruby Soho apparently has been buried underground and she's being used worse now than she ever was in WWE. Wrong. Some say. Some so say. then we had the television championship, Samoa Joe and Minoru Suzuki. I believe the official count was 104 chops back and forth My in God. the first couple of minutes of this match. They're practically bleeding in fact, I think they were bleeding. They Their were bleeding. chests are all <laughs> bruised up, and it's just, it's absolutely brutal. And uh, then they got back into the normal wrestling, and uh, just a great match. I mean, I loved every every moment of this violence. And then uh, finally, Joe goes for the muscle buster. Suzuki tries an arm bar up in the corner. Joe powers out, hits the muscle buster, wins the title. Samoa Joe, the new. The one thing that was funny about it was they go, his long journey is finally complete. And I was like, it's been a week. <laughs> but they were talking about the history of Joe and Ring of Honor, but he's now won the, the Ring of Honor television title. And then, yes, Satnam Singh debuted and beat him up. And uh, him and Lethal and Dutt are a trio. About time we got them trios titles. Back in a moment to talk about a couple of segments in a little more detail. Actually, back in a moment, Observer Live. I've been sitting here taking uh, selfies because, look, look, everybody, I'm here in Sports Byline. I like Austin Theory. Eh, theory, just theory. Are you going to be just Alvarez? Oh, now? yeah, I forgot. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's ridiculous. That's preposterous. But uh, I tweeted it at Brian Alvarez. If you want to see what the uh, world famous Sports Byline studios look like, because, of course, everyone on the YouTube chat doesn't understand it's a radio show. So now there's. Uh, there's proof of it. So I got two things I got to talk about, Mike. Okay. Before we uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about. All right. I'm sure you're very concerned about that. No, I'm not at all. I, I know. So uh, I know. the two segments we got to talk about are this Marina uh, Shafir versus Sky Blue match and uh, and then that uh, Thunder Rosa mm -hmm. thing that yeah. they did. All right. So listen. They've been building up that uh, Jade Cargill is going to face number 30. And uh, who is number 30? Who could this possibly be? And you think about all these different people and, you know, maybe even think somebody like, oh, man, what about Britt Baker? Like, she's not the champion anymore. That'd be a pretty big match and this and that. And so then, uh, you know, they, they randomly announce on television it will be Marina Shafir, okay? And, uh, and if you're watching Dynamite and you only watch Dynamite, you don't watch any of these YouTube shows, you have no earthly idea who Marina Shafir is. You may have this vague memory that she had something to do with WWE and whatever, but it's like, okay, Marina Shafir. Well, that's kind of weird. So then, you know, they do what they should do, which is the next week on television, they show you some some footage of uh, Marina Shafir killing people on the YouTube shows. All right, great. So uh, then we have this match here. And, uh, like, absolutely, positively zero, zero, negative zero interest in Marina Shafir from this crowd. And when it was over, I was like, holy smokes. Like, 
first off, I'm thinking about the quality of the match itself. Marina Shafir and Jade Cargill. Maybe, maybe this could be like a, a good match, okay? But I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is their... They've been building this up very, very big. And then I'm like, are people going to care about this match? That's the other problem. And then, like, the third problem on top of that is the story they're telling is that uh, Jade Cargill is not worried at all about Marina Shafir. Like, she's sitting there and she's texting on her phone. She's not paying attention to the match or anything like that. I'm thinking, is Marina Shafir going to beat Jade Cargill? I don't know. I watched this segment, and I had a lot of questions. Why is it Marina? Why is this the match? Why is... I just had so many questions. Am I the only one? No. I was not bullish on this feud when this segment was over at all. Remember when we talked about it, I had people like, well, how can you say that you know Jade and Marina Shafir, or like Jade can't be... Look, this comes down to Marina Shafir. I like Marina Shafir as a character. If you've seen her outside of... AEW, and you've seen her on Bloodsport, you've seen some of the videos that have been produced for her for her Twitter and Instagram kind of hyping her up where you know, the cigarette goes out, the the coffee goes over, and here's just this bad woman just staring at you ready to kill. I think there's something there with her, but the problem is when you don't see her in Bloodsport, you see how limited she is as a worker because she just hasn't had the time in yet, unfortunately. So she's a project. And then you have Jade, who's only had 30 matches. She can't carry a show. These are both women that, in my opinion, need somebody to make a great match or even sometimes a good match. Somebody out there with some experience to help them. But instead, they're taking these two entities that I think can be strong and they're going to put them together. And I didn't understand why, because I just don't think you're setting Shafir off on the best foot without some explanation as to who she is and some more slaughters on national television, not on YouTube, not on dark and frankly, not even on rampage of this woman working her way up to be deadly. And that would explain, you know, Jade keeps getting cheap, easy wins or not cheap, easy wins, but she keeps getting wins. They could have done that where she's her mind's in the clouds and waited on this for a while. Her mind's in the clouds and Mark Sterling is trying to convince her. And maybe just maybe, you know, Mark Sterling goes with a Marina Shafir who may need if she's going to be in the mix, a mouthpiece to help her out, a presence next to her during these matches with a lot of experience as Mark Sterling in real life absolutely does as a trainer, as a worker, as a wrestler. That's why he's with Jade. I don't know. I, I don't know where well, this let is going to go. This. I don't know how this match is going to be, but I I see these missteps, and I just don't know if, you know, again, Jade isn't going to be hurt by almost anything that happens here, but I don't know if you're, you're maximizing Shafir, you know, the way you should be. Okay, here's the deal. This is what I also got out of this segment, and another segment on the show, and that is that, uh, this is going to seem like a weird analogy, but... You know how we used to watch those old uh, uh, retro Raws and, like, The Rock would go out there and he'd just be doing jobs every week, but he was still over because he was The Rock? And then, like, they had, they got this idea in their head that, you know, we could beat anybody. They'll still be over. And so, like, for 25 years, they've been beating everybody, and it turns out there's not another Rock. And when you beat all these guys, they don't really get over like The Rock did. So anyway, the 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 point of that is... Every now and then they'll they'll have somebody that has never been on American television before. An example would be Minoru Suzuki. The first time Minoru Suzuki showed up, the, the audience that was there in the building went haywire when the first time that the guy showed up. And I think that that's kind of uh, uh, skewed uh, their their vision of of what their audience knows. You know, oh well, you know Suzuki's never been on on U.S. national television, but he got a big pop. So you know. These viewers will will know who the majority of these people are that debut. So anyway, the point is, I still believe that you shouldn't have. It's a really dumb one. I I believe I believe that this Marina thing is is further proof of what we have talked about, which is that if you want somebody to go from elevation and dark to a championship match. Bro, I am not going to rant about the rankings. You can do whatever you want with the rankings, okay? But they need to show up and they need to win matches for two months before it's time for the championship match, okay? 
You know, people, when when they found out Jay Lethal was number three ranked, okay, I'm fine if Jay Lethal won a bunch of matches and in the mathematics or whatever, he's ranked number three. But, brother, I didn't see that guy do any matches on television, and suddenly he's number three. I don't know this, but I saw someone on the board complaining that Frankie Kazarian is now ranked number three. Frankie Kazarian? I haven't seen a Frankie Kazarian singles match, and I don't. Even, it might have been on the boat. So the point of this is, Marina Shafir, if she was going to be number 30, she should have been on TV two months ago slaughtering women to build up to being number 30 for Jade Cargill. Because what it was was, number 30 is going to be Marina Shafir. We're going to do one video package. And then all of a sudden you bring her out with Sky Blue, and clearly nobody cares about Marina. It doesn't matter how many people she beat on Dark. It doesn't matter how many people she beat on El- They don't know her, and they don't care. So she should they should have done this earlier. Now, I also bring this up because there was a segment last night where uh, Hook is doing his interview, and uh, there's Danhausen. And Danhausen tries to do he tries to curse him or whatever. And uh, in a way he goes. And I, I watched it and I thought, it's been many, many weeks now since the debut of Danhausen. Okay. I know Danhausen. I'm sure that the people on the chat and, you know, such, they, they knew Danhausen. But now, now it's been so many weeks that I'm thinking, okay, if you're an average viewer of Dynamite and Rampage, mind you, it has now been like two months, and what in the hell is a Danhausen? Who is this guy? What is he doing? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's there's almost a, there's around a million people that watch this show every week, and I'm telling you 100 percent that there is a large percentage of those people who have absolutely, positively no idea who this painted guy going like this is and why. It's time for that we need a video on Danhausen, or we need a, an interview from Danhausen, or we need something to explain who this guy is to the viewers watching on cable television. Now, I don't want to go any further on that because I have to talk, if I may, Mike, what? about this Thunder Rosa segment. What? In the name of God was this. Thunder Rose is about to do an interview, and once again, she is interrupted before she is allowed to talk. It's ni- I'm laughing, actually, because it's so preposterous. It's Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero, and they have, a, they have a cake. And they explain, this is a cake to celebrate you having the shortest championship reign of anybody ever. And Thunder Rosa looks at them like, what are you talking about? And she kicks the cake into Nyla Rose's face. Nyla Rose is now blinded. She's so blinded that she goes to throw a forearm and she hits Vicky. Vicky takes this big bump or whatever. So Nyla Rose can't even see, but she gets a hold of Thunder Rosa and she beat the hell out of her and she left her for dead. What was that? Am I the only one? Oh, my God. Yeah, it was funny, if you don't mind, like, your champion has just been humiliated, and she was treated worse than Cora Jade this week. Cora Jade needs to sit down and start doing some Christmas cards. Dear Vicky, thank you so much for that segment on Dynamite on April 13th. I really appreciate it. Dear Nyla, I so appreciate... Actually, the one she should write a letter to is Thunder Rosa. Thunder, thank you. I almost got Geek of the Week, but you saved me. Holy smokes, this segment. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not. Thank you. And uh, it's uh, the the line. The only redeeming line was at the end when when Nyla said, "You know, jokes on you because I like cake and violence." I thought that was funny, but the problem was it should have just ended after Vicky. You know, they embarrassed her last week. Have Rosa hit her with the cake in the face. You know, the stumble around, the heel misses. You know. Hits Bobby Heenan, the manager. In this case, it's Vicky. She wouldn't sell as well, didn't sell as well. But that should have been the end of that thing. And then, you know, it would still be cheap, but then we'd have that. I Dan Housen, I've brought it up in the, in the past, and, you know, people acted as though, you know, how dare you, you know, say that. It's like, you know, I know people, but 
a lot of people have said that maybe they should actually mention who this person is. Maybe it was coming from the wrong people that said that. Maybe they'll listen to you. But yeah, actually explain who the hell these people are. They, Tony had an entire bio on on uh, uh, Sing last night. You know, his entire NBA. I know who that is. It's not like Excalibur said it. Tony Schiavone said it. So I don't know. Again, that was... There were, again... It, that show last night, though, and it's not picking nits. Because hey, I will agree, by the way. I will agree, by the way, with this person here who says, the best part of that segment was at the end when Nyla says, I love cake and violence. That was funny. I just, but, I don't know. You saying that is actually worse than me talking about The Rock and the XFL yesterday. Just, I just said that. I just said that, and you repeated well, I was reading the chat. And now people will probably say, Brian Alvarez is a genius for repeating something that Mike well, said. Well, of but course leave the I Mike am. Mike said part out. I said it louder. Yes. <laughs> By the way, did you did you say what this person here said? Who actually said this person actually said the ch- the they said in the chat here. Yes. Danhausen doesn't need to be explained. There you go. See, this is what I got. The this people are actually dead on about that. They're not even trolling. They're serious. Like how how dare you question what a Danhausen is? It would ruin everything if you had to explain a Danhausen to the people. Well, you I'm don't first, need to I explain guess. it, but let the guy do a promo or something. Did you see Regal do the janky leg after the show? After he got uh, after he got the spell put on him by Danhausen, that was awesome. Back in a moment, Observer Live. <laughs> Observer.com, man. Mm-hmm. I spent twelve straight minutes, an entire segment, talking about how I thought Dynamite was an awesome show, with the exception of two segments. And then I have the temerity to criticize two segments and i am just lambasted by these people Mm -hmm. i thought i was the one that was supposed to be been paid by tony khan chimney christmas people defending that thunder rosa they're they're, they're sitting here telling me that you ever been hit with a cake in the face you're not blind you're not trying to tell me she wasn't blind she hit her manager bro she was blinded if this same thing would have happened on raw this same chat would have been ridiculing this segment for an hour but it happens on dynamite and now oh man your check must not have come in this week brian how dare how dare you? How dare you criticize two segments on a dynamite show? Why don't you just wow. go all out and actually, even though you, you you liked it, you know, say something bad about Tony Storm and Jamie Hayter just to complete the cycle of, of people that will now jump on you. No, they had a good segment. They're going to have a match. Like, it's a match people want to see, and they're making the match, and it's a first-round match. And I, it was kind of funny. They're like, this will be a first-round match in the tournament, but we don't have brackets yet. <laughs> Like okay, well that's fine. I would like some brackets for these tournaments here pretty soon. Is that too well, much to ask, or am I going to get in trouble for asking for well, brackets? Well, here's the thing: you can ask for brackets, but I don't want to see any until they're ready. Don't switch this all around or do some nonsense like that. <laughs> By the way, that'll well, listen, be Jamie Hader's best match he has so far, guaranteed. But listen, everybody, I want to thank y'all for listening here today. I want to thank all the folks for all the hospi- us, hus- hostility, hospitality. hospitality here at Sports Byline. They got cookies for my children for crying out loud. Thank you, Dom. Thank you, Darren. I will see you all in 10 years. And the rest of you, I'll see, I guess, tomorrow. Actually, I won't. Mike's taking over tomorrow. See you later, everybody. Talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.